Well, welcome, folks, to another episode of the Coffee Roasters Warm Up Sessions. Today we have our first uh, guest right here in in the room in the podcast room. Um, we had one that was overseas. We chatted with Taylor from Indonesia that works with uh, coffee farmers, producers in Indonesia. But now uh, we have our dear friend uh, Edwin. Um, and uh, Edwin, tell us a little bit about what you do right before we pour a cup of, cup of good coffee. Sure. Well, first, thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure and a privilege. Yeah. And, uh, and it's exciting just doing this here in Bellingham. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, for a lot of reasons. But um, yeah, my name is Edwin Martinez, and I grew up in Guatemala and started Onyx Coffee. And we have a small farm in northwest Guatemala called Finca Vista Hermosa. Nice. Um, I've been living in Bellingham, Washington now for um, about 26 years now. Hmm. Wow. That's, yeah. that's a long time. Yeah, that's Longer pretty, than me, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty incredible. That's cool. Well, uh, we'll dive into Edwin's story a little more here uh, over the, you know, the rest of the episode. But for now, let's pour some. Yes, I feel like it's yeah. always my honor. Well, yeah. Edwin, Edwin, you're going to be <laughs> no, using but... a cupping bowl. Um, so this I'm is the sun. Yeah, gotta like finagle over this mic so I can see. There you go. Don't want to pour beautiful. too much. Those bowls get so hot. Yeah. So, but um, dude, that's dandy. Wow. Enjoying coffee out of a cupping bowl. That's wonderful. <laughs> it's a very very nice cupping bowl. Yeah. It's got a nice mirror, reflective, mm -hmm. but yet very subtle. Yeah. Yep. Yep. A little. That's how we like it. Branding. <laughs> So if it doesn't, I mean, there's a few reasons that I'm going to preface this. There's a few reasons why this cup may not be our favorite. One, this coffee is super fresh. Two days off of roast. I mean, we, super should, be, fresh. we should be cupping it in the bowl. Not, right. Not, not enjoying. Not brewing yeah, it. not enjoying. Um, two, I can almost guarantee I did not use the right grind size. So... Just a good thing I had you rinse those out because you, you know you'd be tasting whatever was left <laughs> what in the last. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sad part. It's lost, um, or it, it's not. I can't taste the complexity in it that we normally have. I noticed a trend watching some of your whoops, mm -hmm. some of your yeah. uh, some of your videos on YouTube last night. You're often disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. that is not good. Um, That's not bad either. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, uh, you're, you're right. You're right. That's true. <laughs> why? 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 I don't That's know. Not the case. I, I feel like every single time I brew a cup of coffee, I feel like, ah, oh, it could be better. Like always. There's, you, always. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, I, I want to say that's a very positive thing. Like sometimes I have a hard time savoring what's good. Oh, say yeah. what's good. I kind of like how that sounds. We need to create a show just for that. Yeah. Um, I will say, though, um, I think what I'm getting a little bit on the front end, though, very briefly, and I'm sure if it, if it just ages just a little bit more and we doubt we were able to dial that in or even brew it on pour mm -hmm. Um I'm noticing uh, on the front end very similar things to what I've noticed on just brewing it as a pour-over. Um, it's got an interesting sweetness that I probably wouldn't categorize as just chocolate. Mm -hmm. It almost like this, I think tropical fruit is a little too far. Yeah. But uh, what do we have? We have cherry, pear, and marzipan, marzipan on, the, on the notes. And I'm getting some of that nice cherry, like something sweet on the front end, which is kind of, kind of enjoyable that I'm liking. Yeah. I would say that it doesn't have as much acidity as I'm used to in this roast. So it's definitely lacking that. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, like, yeah, there's that. Can you taste that little weird aftertaste? And I'm like, that's got to be the freshness. Yeah, a little bit Lots. of astringency. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. a little bit, or, I mean, definitely probably that grind size. So... Which another another uh, constant problem. We never write down our our grind size that we're grinding yeah. coffee on, and every yeah. week we're grinding new coffee. Yeah, and we're always eyeballing. So, but that being said, um, I think um, we've sourced uh, 
a couple of copies from you guys at Onyx, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which have all been just a delight to enjoy. Um, and one of the one of the producers that we've been able to source coffee with you guys is a uh, Jorge Mendez, and his coffees. I feel like we bought I think three different harvests, uh, two from El Panal, one from Las Hoyas, I believe, um, and just his co his coffees, especially the El Panal, just have this interesting flavor profile to them that it's so Guatemalan, but it's also s yeah. so, it's also like pretty complex. It has like an interesting mm -hmm. stone fruit, uh, like pear, cherry, which yeah. I don't know, I've been enjoying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they definitely have flavors of terroir where <clears throat> based on where they're located, mm -hmm. it's not only high elevation, but they're a little bit exposed, so they get cooler mm -hmm. winds. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. that come through the valley and they're, and they're not catching as much as the warm winds that come from the northwest flowing through the whole region in general. Interesting. So the idea of, of microclimates in Guatemala is really interesting because because you can actually get a very different flavor from the same botanical variety. Mm -hmm. You know, we like to talk a lot about yeah. the differences in flavor and variety and that's mm -hmm. definitely a thing. Yeah. But the differences in some of the other elements of terroir can have a greater impact on creating a more different flavor. Gotcha. So if you have the same variety, but it's planted on this side of the ridge versus this side, uh, it wow. may get twice as much sun. Gotcha. And the other one, yep. maybe with more shade, is cooler and it's growing slower. Um, and it may not even fully develop. And so depending on what the weather's like, you can get a lot more sweetness just two meters away, being just wow. on, on a different side of the ridge. Yeah, that, that's incredible. I don't think I, I don't think I've heard the yeah. detail of that before, so that's that's pretty insightful. That's big. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah, that's incredible. Just shows that like, coffee is like, I mean, it just blew my mind when I read that coffee has over eight hundred flavor and aroma compounds. Yeah. As for a wine, I think is at like three hundred, and it's like stuff like that where I'm like, that makes sense. It's mind blowing, but mm -hmm. it's like no, that's why coffee is so. Mm -hmm incredible um but obviously it seems like you know way more about origin yeah. <laughs> and growing coffee than we do um how would you bring us back to edwin for edwin's first kind of experiences in coffee well i don't know if you want me sharing this right now what time we're doing this it's yeah. light out it's, it is it's yeah. 5 21 <laughs> and we're drinking coffee yeah this is very guatemalan Oh, hey, yes. yeah, yeah, I like that. So um, I was at SCA maybe six, seven, eight years ago, maybe 10 years ago. And um, the person who started the marketing company for Pinjalense, which is a manufacturer of, of coffee processing equipment, and I think mm. they're the largest in the world. Wow. So from at, at the farm level. Mm -hmm. um, and this guy used to work for him doing sales, and then he started his own company marketing the same product from the company he used to work at, mm. and that company mm -hmm. grew to be larger yeah. than the manufacturer. Wow. So he was the speaker at SCA, and he shared um, Brazil actually had commercials that aired on TV where they were talking about their um, some of their economic investments in internally. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you think about what can make coffee sustainable, Brazil's the largest producer in the world. Um, it's like 35% globally. Mm -hmm. So... If the weather is a little sketchy there, the market does weird Dang. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so one thing that every producing country can do and should do in some way is how can you, and this is true globally, you know, how do you consume things that you produce locally first? Um, right. And then look at the qualities. And then, of course, exports are, are going to be mm -hmm. really important and often necessary. Mm -hmm. um, but in Brazil, they... Uh, so, you know, they'll serve coffee. It's much weaker, um, but uh, at elementary school. Okay. Um, at elementary wow. school? And so That's I remember wild. when he mentioned that, yeah. half the room, at, at, this is actually at a symposium. So that's, oh, you know, I wow. think people paid $1,000 yeah. for a one or two day prior uh -huh. to SEA. And so it's a lot of executives and, 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 and managers at larger companies or owners of, of small companies. And, uh, and the room, you know, it got quiet. There's kind of a weird reaction. Yeah. Um, but for all of us who, who, you know, maybe grew up in coffee-growing countries, um, I was like, 
that's normal. Yeah. yeah. So in Guatemala, I grew up, um, you know, coffee was in the bottle and some of my cousins, you know, as they were infants and toddlers, yeah. they just had coffee in their bottle. Oh, so wow. it's not this, you know, right. they're, they're not, yeah. you know, I didn't grow up understanding, you know, what's the proper ratio and you know, no TDS meter. Yeah. It's just brew the coffee, a little bit of coffee, lots of water. So it's really weak and it's mm-hmm. really just a lightly tainted coffee flavored water mm-hmm. and then put milk and sugar. Um, mm-hmm. So it was really more like a, a, a latte yeah. Yeah. <laughs> where you forgot to put the coffee in it almost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the coffee cup still had a little, few drips in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I, I grew up just seeing that it was consumed morning, noon, and at night. And that's part of how it's easier to, to regularly drink coffee at night if it's brewed weaker. So yeah. that's part of how, how I grew up. My, my grandfather's 102 this year. My, my grandfather's... Wow. My grandmother's not alive anymore. She she actually would serve the sugar into his cup. And he, uh, until she passed away, did not know how much sugar went in his own cup. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But there was always sugar yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so I, I think I grew up with, with a great familiarity with coffee yeah. from a consumer standpoint. And just we spent all of our holidays and time in the summer and Christmas, spring break, um, at, at the farm. Yeah. Um, so my, my experiences were, I think, very um, much both at the, you know, at the growing level, seeing what it's like um, mm-hmm. to plant and literally get my hands dirty playing in a, in a pile of dirt and then planting coffee and, and, uh, yeah. and then drinking, you know, really horrible <laughs> quality, roasted poorly, brewed very weak yeah. and really enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, roasted? What, are we talking like a pan? Uh, sometimes, um, yeah. yeah. There's 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 actually now a brand called uh, I think it's El Jarrito, which means like the little jar. It's like kind of like a little carafe. Okay. Um, and and that's an instant product. And you tear this pack, mm-hmm. and the pack itself it says it makes like eight to ten cups. Mm. Um, but if you're thinking of proper brew ratio, it maybe will make one. <laughs> um, like, oh, but the instructions yeah, say it's yeah. like eight to ten yeah. cups. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and that's really common. Um, okay. And that's probably what most coffee farmers drink in okay. Guatemala. That's incredible because it kind of um, when we talk about I don't know for as roasters we we're always thinking like. How can we roast this coffee uh, so well that it actually lets the potential of the coffee um, shine mm-hmm. to all everything that the producer and the farmer were able to put into that, the potential in there? Um, and we're always considering this, uh, having the producer in the back of our head as we're, as we're kind of developing this bean. It's interesting, though, that the, how they're consuming coffee is actually significantly different than mm-hmm. we in the States. But I mean, I'm I'm gonna assume that's changed over the course of the year or years, right? So it's it's changed yeah. a little bit. Yeah, it's changed a little bit. Yeah, and but, um, yeah, yeah. I would say like I I love hearing stories like that. Like one, they bring a lot of value to me because there's this connection point for me of like something that I've in a similar way, definitely not even close, just similar tinge of my experience was mm-hmm. like that. Like I spent some time in. Costa Rica, like before I was in specialty coffee, before I, you know, did anything coffee related, like my beverage was like a Starbucks cup of coffee, something super simple. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had that moment of having coffee in the morning at the location that I was working at and then walking down the hill to the bus stop and walking through a coffee farm. And I did that multiple times because I worked in a lot of producing nations without, you know, realizing did that in Brazil, I did that in Indonesia and I think those experiences, similar in connection to like your story, is what actually drove me to want to be in specialty coffee. Mm. Um, so that's like, I love hearing that. Like that, I'm like, oh man, that makes me energized, you mm-hmm. know? So you were saying like that was your um, kind of introduction to coffee itself. Like, so how did that move from that experience and story to like the professional side of coffee? A lot of failure. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. Just epic amounts of failure. And 
so, I mean, I think I, I always enjoyed the, I, I've always enjoyed the idea of developing mm -hmm. and the creative aspect of innovation. Um, and just seeing how challenging it is at the farm level when you try and make a plan and there's so much that's out of your control mm -hmm. and the decisions that you make are, are not really short term. Yeah. Um, a lot, a lot of them are, but they're really driven by a long-term goal. Yeah. And that long-term goal sometimes means you make decisions that don't make sense at all in the mm -hmm. short term. Mm -hmm. uh, so when, when you plant a seed at, at a higher elevation in particular, so lower grows faster. This is true for anything you plant. Mm -hmm. um, and a quick parenthesis, it's a really, really simple way to boil down all the complexities of what makes sweet coffee mm -hmm. slow growing. It's that yeah. simple. Yeah. There's a lot of things that impact that. Yeah. So you plant the seed and it's seven years before we have a mature harvest. We're going to get fruit in maybe two or three. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a little more substantial in four to five, um, but it's going to really come around and, and have complexity that it won't have at four years at about mm -hmm. six, seven years. Um, so, so seeing that was just hard for me to wrap my head around because mm -hmm. I have a short attention span. And so to make a decision, like, what should we plant here? Yeah. Like, well, we're not going to know what it tastes like for seven years. Mm -hmm. So these are things that I started thinking about wow. maybe just 15 years ago. Wow. Yeah, and okay. so the farm, my, my grandparents um, started it in 1957. Okay. So then I think, okay, who else in my family, my aunts and uncles and my grandparents, mm -hmm. my parents have thought about these things. Mm -hmm. And so I started asking and, and it really wasn't a question about what should we plant based on flavor uh, at all. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even a thought. It was what's the best thing to plant based on what our neighbors recommend or uh, mm -hmm. a, an agronomist. Yeah. And, and their recommendations are all going to be based on what's resilient mm -hmm. and what's going to produce a high yield. And, and the quality element was, was not a big topic. So we were very lucky that we just didn't know of or have access to varieties that, that weren't going to produce a, a higher quality. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and then also at a higher elevation, um, there's just you know some varieties that w will really struggle. Um, and so a variety that can do well growing slowly um, and requires a little bit more care mm -hmm. is, is naturally a better fit because the fact that it grows slowly means it's not going to require as much attention. Okay. Um, yeah. As many inputs because it's just going to go slowly dependent on the soil and yeah. the limited resources. So mm -hmm. um, I actually really wrestled through a lot of the, the questions of the, the time that it takes mm -hmm. um, because I, I remember asking my, my grandfather, okay, so if we, if we plant something here, how long does it take before this is going to produce? And then how much is that going to produce? And what do mm -hmm. we sell that for? And I was always asking these kinds mm -hmm. of questions, trying to figure out like how it makes sense, literally. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it never yeah. made sense. Yeah. yeah. And to this wow. day, it still doesn't yeah. really make sense. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. And so I, I've just kind of grown up constantly asking, how, how does this work? And mm -hmm. I constantly find that it doesn't really work for the most part. Um, and, and so that's, that's part of, you know, what's, what, what's been a, an ongoing curiosity. Mm -hmm. So, but how I got into coffee really came, you know, uh, by choice, because that's just kind of how I grew up, mm -hmm. was more here in Bellingham. Oh, okay. Um, I started an espresso cart on Meridian. No way. <laughs> I think <laughs> I've heard of this I had story. a Mac Digit one group, Nuovo Simonelli. Ooh. And, and, and I pulled shots. I don't even remember what coffee I was using. Um, and people would ask to buy the, the pucks because they wanted to what? eat them. And, and so, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, Why? And this was when there were, there were no, well, there were a lot of um, carts popping up everywhere. Okay. There weren't a lot of drive throughs mm -hmm. um, And carts were a very common thing in, in Seattle. Okay. What um, year is this? This would have been, um, let's see, 95. Ooh. Fall of 95. Okay. 
So that, uh, I would say that uh, maybe I'm wrong, but that's like the prime of second wave coffee. Like, yeah. So yeah. people were learning about like the amazing thing was how many flavors existed of syrups. They just kept yes. growing yeah. and yeah. growing. Okay. Yeah. And, and that was a draw. And yeah. so a big value for carts, you know, you needed a bigger cart because mm-hmm. you needed to hold more bottles. Yeah. Okay. And mm-hmm. you'd have this big display and, you know, there was a lot of marketing from companies that would promote more of an Italian culture where you'd go to a bar, mm-hmm. like a coffee bar, where, you, where it was also a bar where you could get a, a cocktail, but you have have all these syrups yeah. Yeah. on the wall. Yep. Um, and so manufacturers, and there's a few in Seattle that did really well for a few years. And so the cart I got was actually uh, a defective, rejected, uh, made for a Chevron gas station. So it was Chevron blue. <laughs> And, and there were a few chips on the, um, what is that called? It's like that plastic that you glue onto, to wood. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I can see it. I don't know. But, I don't know the word for it, but yeah. Is it Formica? Mm, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't I'm not but sure. But I, yeah. I can totally visualize it. I can visualize it. But it's it. a black and white, just the colors of a Chevron gas station. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's, that's where I started. Okay. And I had. Um, I had four employees and we were all at well, Western. We started with four employees. Started with four. Wow. Out of the gate. That's bold. We started with zero. Well, <laughs> the reason I started with four is because I knew it wouldn't make money. So uh, I had to have okay. another job. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We know how that feels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, it, it eventually, it, it covered its costs. Yeah. Um, and then I learned, um, I got into catering okay. and that went really well. Um, so that really was what kept it going. But, um, so from there, just fast forwarding to, um, oh, let's see about 19 years ago, I was 19, 20 years ago, I was working at a bank, U S bank here in Bellingham. Mm. And somebody came in and said, yeah, my husband's working with our neighbor, starting a company manufacturing roasters. You mean roasting, not actually manufacturing roasters. No, they're making machines that roast coffee. Wow. That's interesting. In Bellingham. And and somehow it came up that we had our family at a farm. And so she said, you should talk to them. Here. She gave me her husband's number. So I called him and I thought this, I'm sure I'm confused. She's probably confused about what her own husband does. I'm like, but <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure enough. Um, it's a couple of guys that one winter they ended up, uh, they ran out of coffee and one of them was a combustion engineer. Um, he had a doctorate in combustion engineering and I think he worked at NASA and he's, wow. he's from the UK and, yeah. but he was living on Samish Island oh, okay. and, uh, and his neighbor was a tugboat captain. And he happened to bring back a half a bag of coffee from Panama a few years back that was just okay. sitting in his garage of raw coffee. And he said, let's hmm. turn this stuff brown. Yeah. Yeah. You know about combustion? We need This <laughs> yeah. needs heat. Let's yeah. bring some heat. And so they started a company. Uh, it was called Sid and Jerry's, and that was their names. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, kind of sounding like Ben and Jerry's yeah. ice cream. Um, it became Coffee Kinetics. I was their first employee. And so I designed the roast profile. On, on that roaster wow. um, by going to Diedrich and taking a seminar yeah. and learning what they nice. recommend. I'm yeah. like, here. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That's um, good. Because while I was hired as the expert, I, I really knew nothing. Mm-hmm. I knew a little bit more than they did, but I had no clue. Um, yeah. And our family had a farm. Yeah. And so somehow, uh, you know, we were all kind of lost, but we all knew a little bit about what was coming together. And so I learned a lot through playing around with the roaster mm-hmm. about roasting. And then we opened a cafe called Cafe Weiwei here in Bellingham. And people nice. thought it was a paint store or a Vietnamese food. Um, and, um, and we roasted one pound at a time to order. So you'd pick your origin. You'd pick your degree of roast. Wow. And almost 20 years ago, people were paying between $15 and $21 a pound for custom roasted to order so it was wow that's impressive you know, that's it, powerful you that's, mentioned yeah. earlier something that's literally bonkers out of this world that's what that <laughs> felt yeah. like yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure it's, yeah. it's just i i tried to calculate even 
though it made no sense comparing to what anyone else was doing, mm -hmm. the cost of what we were doing, mm -hmm. the labor, the lack of efficiency, yeah. the customization, and tried to put a value to it. And I thought, I just, I, I'm not wanting to make this expensive, but it is really unique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so we sold a lot of coffee and people found great value. They'd come and they, like, they wouldn't stretch and buy one and never come back yeah. as a curiosity. They would come back and they'd buy two or three at a time, every time. Wow. Uh, because they were asking for a custom roast because they had a friend. It was almost mm -hmm. like, I need to I need yeah. a gift. They're buying a lot of gifts, right. but yeah, always right. something for themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And each roast took almost 20 minutes because it had to warm up and then it would go through the roast cycle and then it would cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So wow. from there. Uh, so were batches that small? Like one pound, I guess if someone, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. Okay. Wow. That's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> so that man. that's kind of the yeah. tipping point. That okay. cafe was open for two years. Okay. Yeah. And the first year, my wife Nina and I, we made about two dollars and thirty some cents an hour. This is what I figured based on the wow. time we put in, which mm -hmm. is more mm -hmm. than the hours we were open. Yeah. Um, dividing that into our income. Mm -hmm. And and we paid all our bills with that. Um, wow. We lived in a, an apartment, didn't have kids, um, and so we. Wow. Yeah. We were pretty happy because the cafe closed at three. So yeah, time. it's not yeah. like we were working late hours. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Still had to work, you know, had time to work on the business mm -hmm. outside of in the business. Um, but it was that second year where really what I'm, we're doing now took roots. Yeah. Because I was bringing coffee. So the coffee we were roasting, I was buying from other importers. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, because I was searching, like, how can we buy our own coffee? Mm -hmm. I wanted to share our own right. coffee. Right. But it's in Guatemala, and mm -hmm. we're here. And yeah. I'm going back yeah. to Guatemala, but how can I? And so at first, I tried to solve my own problem myself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just brought it up and check on suitcases. And then I would have, we'd have groups that would come and do projects, and maybe they were building a school or a house or mm -hmm. painting. And so I'd have people bring 20 or 30 people at a time bringing at that time up, up to the weight limits were higher on suitcases mm -hmm. and you could bring two and you didn't have to pay. So we'd max out two suitcases for every person. Yes. Yeah. And, and so like, I, you have no idea how many times I've been to, to value village and goodwill to get <laughs> yeah. suitcases, to give to people to yeah. bring back with yeah. coffee. Yeah. So that's how I got into exporting and importing. Okay. That's powerful. Um, wow. I didn't have a license to do that. Yeah. I just did it. Yeah. That's great. I, yeah. I love that. I don't know. I feel like um, this, I'm purely from a business standpoint. It's just like such a bootstrap, like, let's get it done. Like such yeah. a rough, like down and dirty, like we're just going to figure out how to do this with the bare minimum. Like we want to get coffee in. How do we do it? And you just go and you figure it out. Yeah, like hearing you share that part, um, I can sense this like energy and this drive. Um, so it has to be fueled by something. So that that's what I want to know. Like you're going through all this hardship. You're uh, making not a great amount of money um, living in an apartment, but you're able to pay your bills. Now you're like importing coffee. Um, the only way you know how to do it at this point, probably. And you're still like, there's a drive for more. Like, where's that like passion and drive coming from? Well, it actually gets worse. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it gets worse okay. because, so I went with my wife to Guatemala with the plan of, you know, we were fairly newly wed. And so it was kind of an opportunity to have like an extended honeymoon. Mm-hmm. And for both of us, for her to really work on Spanish and me as well. Um, and the third objective, and this was kind of what, what, what brought it up, and then we kind of built around it, was, was to get a license. Because I just, you know, as I told people, like, well, that's not going to scale yeah. suitcases. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we need to hire 100 employees with suitcases. <laughs> so um, it took six months. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, being bilingual and, uh, I was studying international business. Mm -hmm. And so that was my interest. Oh, okay. And so I, I figured that, um, if, if anyone could do it, I figured I could do it. 
Yeah. I, I was clueless. <laughs> I was absolutely clueless. Um, and so I, I went to the Coffee Producers Association and asked, um, we have a farm. I'm told that we can export our coffee. They said, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so it was a process of asking questions where finally they gave me a form to fill out. Okay. Um, but just getting to that first form, um, they had to loop in like four or five other people and they had a meeting like 15 feet away from me. So I, so I couldn't hear and like, what are they talking about? I just want to apply. Yeah. Just give me the paper and I'll put the information on it. Um, and so they, they told me that, well, we have a form, but it's not been approved by the board. Um, mm. and so no one's ever really done this before. No one's done it before. I'm like, yeah, it's so how does anyone export coffee? Yeah. <laughs> if no one's got a license, yeah. no one's gotten a license. Yeah. And so when I got a license at that time, it had just been grandfathered in or you had to know someone. Oh, mm-hmm. okay. And so I was the first to go through the process and yeah. really kind of developing the process. So it, it turned into a, almost a three quarter inch thick book of pages. Eventually wow. it was on a DVD. Now you can just go on your phone and click. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You still need a lot of help with attorneys and um, people that can help with those kinds of transactions mm-hmm. because you need to set up a business and a business yeah. license. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it took six months to get that. And, and, and that was just like the door open to then spend resources, uh, time and money. Mm-hmm. And so I, we had sold coffee in an auction to someone in Japan for $1.65. So I thought, well, it's an auction, yeah. so that must be a good price. Um, I had no idea at the time that that was actually below the cost of our okay. production. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. I thought that must be a good price. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we've gotten less before, and this is more. So, uh, so I committed to paying that to my family, um, mm-hmm. and I took about a third of a container, my first container, and my grandfather, my dad. Um, and, uh, and next year, one of our a producer neighbor came with us, but we, we went to the port and I hired armed, gar- armed guards that traveled with us and the truck and we stayed at the port and then I snuck into the port because I wanted to go in. So I was actually sitting in the, with the truck driver yeah. mm-hmm. going into the secure area. Huh. And, um, and so really I was with our coffee, you know, our manager was sleeping with the coffee at the dry mill until we loaded it. So from yeah. the time we brought it from our farm, like mm-hmm. we didn't physically leave any space between the coffee and yeah. us mm-hmm. yeah. until I put a lock on the container. And then I, I unlocked it at 1585 yeah. Mount Baker highway where we used to live. Oh dang. And a 20 foot container backed up right yeah. off Mount Baker highway. Oh. Like you're going to pass that <laughs> yeah. turn. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and we put it in our garage. You wow. should, I, I do want to interrupt you for a second. You should, what was that feeling like? Like your grandparents, your family, you're there and you guys are about to export your first container. It's got to have been like a really, like for your family, for that community, it's got to have been like a pretty monumental experience or no? It was really surreal because Mm -hmm. there's so many things about, you know, the the time element for someone who grows coffee, your, your income comes very differently than, you know, it's like any farmer. Yeah. You know, your income is not like a, a, a job where you get a mm-hmm. paycheck every week or every right. two weeks or month. It's, you get your entire annual salary, um, you know, maybe in a day, but it, it's going to be condensed somewhere in a 30 to 90 day window. Mm-hmm. And it usually can be identified to just like two or three days where you get your entire annual salary, your annual income. And that income may be above your costs. It may be the same, maybe below, it may be way below. Yeah. And you don't, you don't really know that until you get there. Yeah. And most people that get there don't really know the expenses that they've in, up. like right. what it's cost to get there. Right. Mm-hmm. So even when you're there, a, a lot of people don't understand their cost of production. So they don't know if they're making money or losing money yeah. or how much they're losing or making. Um, mm-hmm. And that included us. But yet here we are, we're spending more money and still being clueless Yeah, yeah. and watching it just go out into the sea. That's a big risk. Yeah. And, and even now I look back and it's just, you know, with, yeah. since, since COVID, there's just been the supply chain challenges where mm-hmm. three weeks ago off the coast of LA, 62 containers. And I was just playing around with, like if, if there's, let's say if there's a high quality coffee and we value them at a hundred thousand a piece, mm-hmm. 
Um, if there's a thousand containers per ship, that's six point two billion dollars. It was just sitting there for yeah. a month. Like, what does that cost? Who pays yeah. for that? Someone wow. does. Yeah. Um, and that's if they're a thousand containers. And a lot of ships yeah. carry ten to twenty. Mm -hmm. Like the biggest ships carry twenty two, twenty three, twenty four thousand containers. Yeah. yeah. So that would be sixty or one hundred and twenty billion dollars. Wow! Oh know, my gosh! Dude, just, just, just you know, three weeks ago, yeah. off the coast of LA. Yeah. So, um, wow. Obviously, it wasn't all coffee, and yeah. Yeah, they weren't all sure. the biggest ships. But yeah. yeah. So it was really surreal because yeah. I'm, I'm seeing it go out into the ocean, and yeah, like I, I hope it makes it back to land. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know what I'm going to do when it does, but I need I need to figure out how to sell it. Yeah. I yeah. can't sell it one pound at a time roasted, I don't mm -hmm. think. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And my goal was to sell it all raw. Mm -hmm. At that point, have you made any kind of sales connections with roasters? I made a lot. Whoa. I okay. made a lot. So I sent samples out to, mm, I sent samples to about 150 people. I sent a couple thousand emails out. And I mailed postcards to, I think, 200 people, 200 companies. Wow. So you did the back-end work. You were heavy on the back-end work before you ever, like, professionally imported. I was kind of doing it simultaneously. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I had someone came in. Um, Brian Schutte is his name. Uh, and he was studying international business, mm -hmm. getting an MBA at Western. And he came to Cafe Weiwei, our little cafe. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want to do an internship. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> um, and my wife wouldn't marry me if I didn't graduate. And so I, I, I just like, what's the fastest way out of here? And I got a degree in general <laughs> studies, which is a little bit of everything or a lot of nothing. So yeah. I, I did that. <laughs> and, and I didn't get what I was shooting for, but this guy wanted to intern. And yeah. he, he got that degree that I was hoping. He, actually a master's. So he was pursuing an I thought this could add value, but I really need to be honest. Uh, he wants an inter internship um, with a company that's international and doing import and export. I'm like, okay, let me tell you about what my import currently looks like. Mm -hmm. See that suitcase? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so, great. So we need to work on this business plan. Yeah. yeah. And he's actually who who did most of the work. He designed the logo for Finca Vicermosa that we, oh, my nice. wife then stenciled and cut it out on cardboard and spray painted on every bag. Nice. So we, yeah. like every bag, like we painted, hand spray painted mm -hmm. each one of them. Um, this is in our house in Weiwei, up in the mountains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of cost and it just started snowballing mm -hmm. and we got a lot of great feedback. I remember like George Howell, he had started the Cup of Excellence with Susie Spindler and he gave great feedback. He said, this is one of the best Guatemalan coffees I've ever had. Whoa. And a couple of years later, like he, he wanted a container, but frozen. I'm like, this is interesting, exciting, innovative, but will you pay for it in advance? Yeah. Like, well, no, um, you know, got to see how it works. I can't, I can't take that risk. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I got a lot of good feedback from George, people. of course, of all people. <laughs> <laughs> frozen. I'm, not, I'm not surprised. Frozen for more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And so he came back and came back with his wife and, and visited. Um, so, you know, we had made a connection there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at the time we had a lot of roasters that in the following years came to visit. Um, wow. And it came to the point where we had almost a hundred roasters a year. Wow. This is to one over, farm to our farm. And we take them to one or two others in the beginning. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow. okay. So at that point, are you also then creating a network of farmers and producers you're working with? Or is this like yes. still like small and family oriented? We would develop a network. So I, okay. I jumped a gap there about five years. So initially, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. it mm -hmm. took me a year and a half to sell that first import. Okay. And I sold it for 89 cents a pound a year and a half later. What and was I, the C market I, then? Do you know? Um, I don't remember, but I, commi it was, I, I committed to pay $1.65 a pound. Oh, and the okay. C market was below that. Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I sold it for like half of what I committed to pay for it about 18 months later. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of time sunk into that as yeah. well. Um, of and I sold it all, I'm not going to say to who, but I sold it all to one person wow. just because I needed to sell it. Yeah. And I was yeah. sitting on it. Yeah. And, and everybody Fair. told me, I mean, this is talk about learning from pain. Everybody mm. told me, we love your coffee. I'm like, great. How much do you want? Oh, I, I can't buy any right now. Classic. And that's where I learned so, about oh, yeah. the that planning is, yeah. and the commitments. Familiar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 
Wow. That's, that's, yeah, that's just incredible. Um, yeah, how does, how do, so you guys are now growing, you guys are, you know, you're building a network. Um, what does connecting with, ro- I'm assuming that there's not as many roasters as there are right now. Like right now, the, there's a heavy saturated market of roasters. Mm-hmm. What was that like finding roasters? Like, was it like a difficult find or hmm. I don't know. I was not in coffee back then. So yeah, I, I think especially for us right now, like everything is heavy and driven by like social media. And I would assume is this like before the major like online social media boom like, give us an error time here. Okay, okay. So here's a couple random data yeah. points. Um, before I dove in, I, so I've been going to SEA for over a couple decades, and I went and interviewed every single importer I could find. And it was mostly multinationals, but there were a lot of smaller independents. Mm-hmm. Um, and I asked them, here's what I want to do. I, I, I want to bring our own coffee up, and I want to import, and then maybe from some other neighbors as well. Mm-hmm. And... Almost every one of them said, don't do it. It's too mm. difficult. It's very complex. And it's not lucrative. The margins are small. It's a volume game. Yeah. And, uh, and they were not trying to dissuade me because they were concerned that I was going to compete with them. Mm-hmm. Like I was kind of a laughable, annoying. Um, they were genuinely being kind, I, I believe, wanting yeah. to be helpful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so every single one of them said, don't, don't do it. Very kindly except for one person, and her name is Erna Knutson, and she's who coined the term specialty coffee. So she was cupping at the age of 14. Uh, She's from Norway, and she was cupping at 14 in New York uh, when women did not work in coffee, in business, in trade. Yeah. And she was cupping and learning quality. Yeah. Um, And and so she started, you know, her own company, and and she passed away in her mid-90s, and my wife and I went down to try and buy her company in San Francisco, and she said, no, my exit plan is death. And if I die, <laughs> my husband's still alive, talk to him. That was it. Like wow. we flew down just to try and make an offer and yeah, talk yeah. about it. And like, that's as far as the conversation went. Um, Gosh, that's powerful. but she encouraged me, yeah. uh, because she said, you know, I only know one person who's doing what you want to do and they're doing really well. And like, well, tell me about it. And it's a yeah. guy named to this day, I've not met him, Bill McAlpin. And he bought a farm in Costa Rica called La Minita. And invested in really great processing, really mm, good processing. Okay. So the quality coming off that farm was great. So I was talking to a lot of people that were excited about that quality mm-hmm. and they were paying a price that reflected the work that took to get there. Yeah. So that to me yeah. was enough. Yeah. There's 150,000 mm-hmm. farmers in Guatemala at the time, yeah. 65,000. No yeah. one's really new in this. Uh, there were a lot of larger farms that had direct trade relationships long mm-hmm. before people invented direct Coined trade. It. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but they had resources. They weren't stretching to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of farmers that maybe had other businesses. So most of the farms in Guatemala are very small to mid sized, and then you have a few that are larger. Mm-hmm. And when I say few, um, maybe a few hundred okay. mm-hmm. out of 125,000. Yeah that are producing 10 to 50 containers versus okay, 10 yeah. to 50 bags. Gotcha. And, yeah. and so for us, you know, we're not the big guys. We're not the smallest, but we're definitely in that small bucket. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so the accessibility um, was unimaginable. Um, but when Erna encouraged me, I said, all right, I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's all I needed. So... Having sent samples out, having people say that they wanted, they liked the coffee and they wanted it, I thought, okay, this year's going to be terrible. And if I can live through this, next year's going to be good. So I, right. the next year, I, I more than doubled down. I went three times as much volume. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it was all sold before it, before it shipped. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, That's powerful. And so I continued that trend for a few years and, and then, you know, just started learning all sorts of other yeah. pains, growing pains of, of business. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, yeah, as we, I mean, w- there's just so much solid information. So thanks for sharing all of that. That's, that's yeah. an awesome story. Um, I did have a lingering question, um, which th- I mean, as I want to wrap this up soon, cause we're, uh, 
going pretty long on this episode, which I'm not mad about. Um, but I did want to say is um, now you own Onyx, you're running it, you're, I mean, I don't know how many roasters you guys serve, but I'm assuming it's a lot, us being one of them. Um, how has everything kind of like your past life with, you know, growing up on a farm, moving here, being a cafe owner, you know, roasting a little bit even, how has all that played a role in you being the owner of, you know, Onyx Coffee Importers? Like, as opposed to somebody who maybe just said, hey, I want to become an importer. I'm kind of intrigued in international business. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, how has your, your past history, your life um, impacted how, what you're doing right now, presently with Onyx? Well, I think just seeing how hard it is to produce something great, how mm -hmm. much risk goes into it, how much time it takes, um, and seeing that the reward is, is, is rarely justifying the work. So, like, why would you do something? Yeah. You either do it because you love it or because you need to. You yeah. just don't have a choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the answer for most people growing coffee. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes you bounce back and forth. Sometimes it's like, all right, I love it. And as long as I can do it, I'm just going to do it because I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of reward. I think anytime you work hard on anything, you know, over time you, you gain some, some level of appreciation. Even yeah. if you don't love it, you, yeah. you appreciate the work. Mm -hmm. You appreciate that it takes work to mm -hmm. accomplish something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that was just constantly leaving me very humbled seeing how much work went mm -hmm. into producing coffee and then learning that it's just too cheap yeah. and that the cost of production is often a little bit or a lot higher than what people are selling it for mm -hmm. six out of seven years for decades, for generations. Wow. So, so coffee, uh, the market's up right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's still not much different than when I was born. Yeah. Like what other, product consumable like a gallon of milk or whatever food right. staple can you think of that has not gone up in, mm -hmm. in four or five decades um yeah so that's just always kind of burning in my mind and i think that's probably the biggest driver mm -hmm. uh, for onyx because i feel that growing up bilingual and studying business it's just not fair like what, what is everyone else going to do right you know, I took some risks and had some big pains and then got to a point where we could connect our coffee to people that really valued it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not doing any more work than our neighbors in terms of growing coffee. I'm not taking any more risk in terms of growing coffee. Mm -hmm. um, and so just finding ways to essentially facilitate more connections of quality-driven farmers with mm -hmm. quality-driven roasters. Yeah. And, and there's cool. a lot of complicated ways to try and... and check boxes to see what's a good fit because really at Onyx what we're, what we're doing is we're, we're matchmakers Yeah, yeah. because I don't want to do the work over and over and over again. I, I want to grow relationship and grow yeah. value. Mm -hmm. I want both a roaster and a farmer to see a long-term future. Mm -hmm. um, anytime someone's thinking short term, I don't want to criticize that, but it's not sustainable. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just not. It's reactive. It's not yeah. sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And it's not nearly as rewarding yeah. either. Um, yeah, yeah. And you just have to constantly <laughs> navigate so many challenges. I mean, you asked about the, the era when I started importing. And yeah. um, one of the first customers, I, one of my first cold calls was at uh, Victrola <laughs> on 15th Avenue. And beautiful. <laughs> there's a manager, David Latorell, and he helped launch Clover and... Um, Actually, the Clover debut was in the new Victrola location, which is what's on Pike right now, new at that time. Wow. And, I didn't know that. Huh. Um, and there was this, this, this quiet guy in the back who was chained to an IR-12. It's, it's the same roaster you have. Yes. Uh, his name is Tony. He goes by Tonks, and he sold eventually that Tonks to, to Blue Bottle and started uh, Yes, Please. Oh, wow. And so he was roasting in the back. Wow. Kyle Glanville from Go Get Em Tiger. Yeah. Um, or GNB. So he was a very shy barista that was just sitting in the back room as I did a presentation. Um, 
on our farm and coffee and it felt yeah. really mm -hmm. awkward. Yeah. And they looked at me and I don't, you know, I don't know what they thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the owners, uh, I think he was a computer programmer, Chris and Jen. Um, you know, they, they sense I helped them facilitate selling the company to someone else that I met that also was roasting coffee. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was some of those early connections that helped because mm -hmm. we were all pretty naive and lost. And, yeah. and so, Chris from Victrola, um, Chris and Jen, the owners, and then Tony, were both using WordPress to do a blog. Mm. So I started blogging, and I'm yes. like, how many how many other people are doing this? And like I looked around, there was there weren't very many blogs out wow. there. Wow, yeah. So for you know a blog was kind of rare, and then to have a farmer mm -hmm. blogging to consumers in yep. North America. Um, wow, that's very so, cutting edge, especially in that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you sharing like so much history and like unpacking like that story. Uh, I think, I think my big question then, and I don't know how much time we have. I mean, gosh, like this, this conversation side note is like really energizing me in two ways. Like I'm just so excited to hear like what you're working on, but then I'm also inspired to know that like we have a journey and it's hard right now and we're working like hours but we can continue going because of your story. So with that said, like if you could look at just the course of time in the industry that you've experienced, um, is it like unveiling, like unveiling like a map to move forward? Like, because a lot of the things that you're sharing, like even the last thing you shared, uh, shared about like WordPress, that was such a new way of communicating mm. the stories of like farmers so it was pretty cutting edge. It didn't become mainstream for a long time. Mm -hmm. And even the things you shared about like sustainability and pricing, like those are like big conversations that we're having now, but it took such a long time for us to have those conversations and make them mainstream. Mm -hmm. So if you could share, I don't know, maybe you can't, I don't know. What are some things that you see in the industry or even within Onyx, within um, green coffee, um, like buyers and then farmers, like what are you seeing that you are thinking, man, in the future, this is what the conversation is going to be about. Hmm. <laughs> big question. It is a big question yeah. that requires answers that I think are unimaginable right yeah. now. Okay. Um, and, but somehow they address problems that we can't solve collaboratively, collectively. And so what I mean by problems we can't solve are the challenge, like, I mean, historically, farmers take all the risk. And from there moving forward, the only risk is, is how much you choose to take. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's some variables that really lock this, this strange dynamic in, in, a, in a bad place um, where no matter how hard a producer works, that, that quality, you know, it really can't ever be made better. You can only make it worse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of opportunities to mess it up. Yeah. And, and the industry has traditionally been really good, actually, at preserving quality pretty decently mm -hmm. uh, from farm to all the way up to the roaster. And then at that point, I'm not saying that the quality drops, but that's where you have this, this shotgun spread approach of, yeah. of mm -hmm. expressions of right. that coffee. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think... Ultimately, having, you know, education mm -hmm. is a really important piece. Um, and education is expensive. Yeah. Um, but there's value that comes out of education. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's kind of why I started Onyx Coffee Bar however many years back. Yeah, yeah. Just because I wanted to learn how can education be sustainable. Because yeah. Yeah. people pay to go to school. No one pays you to go to university. No one pays. Like, people pay to go to school. Yeah. But how can there be a model where, where it's economically sustainable or profitable mm -hmm. uh, to have a system that teaches for learning? Um, yeah. But somehow it, that needs to happen in the entire supply chain, like more understanding yeah. of what cost of production are and all the way through. Um, and then 
appreciation for the product is, I think, ultimately going to be what drives. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just messaging with the, the president of Ana Cafe, and, and they just launched a new brand for the Guatemalan Coffee Producers Association. Okay, wow. And I'm really excited about it. Yeah. It's, it's very bold and risky. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not new or innovative. Uh, Colombia did this, mm-hmm. but they're marketing to consumers uh, instead of marketing big. to yeah. the industry. Yep. And so Colombia marketed heavily for decades into North America. So 20 years ago, I would talk to people about coffee and they'd say, well, is it Colombian? If it's Colombian coffee, it's good. If, if not, yeah. then, it's, then it's not good. Like Colombian yeah. coffee is good coffee. Yeah. yeah, it used to be paired with like 100% That's Arabica crazy. and 100% Colombian. I remember seeing that was a big thing. Yeah. 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 So they just yeah. launched. And the idea, and this is bold. And the reason I say it's risky is because the cost for me to talk to a roaster, mm-hmm. like it, it's a real cost. But if I want to talk to a consumer... Now I'm talking to your customer. Yeah. And I can reach a lot more consumers by talking to you. But what Ana Cafe is doing is they're bypassing and they're talking to the consumers. Oh, okay. So it's really assisting every link in between mm-hmm. to lift, lift the bar and the brand in some way. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, I think it's, it's just education yep. through the supply chain mm-hmm. um, that, that's going to bring more sustainability because even today, that the cost of production for most high quality coffees is, is, is not being covered by what, what's paid. Wow. And when, when the market does go up, a funny thing happens. Quality goes down. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, leaving yeah, you with the, just leave hanging with that. With the mic drop. It's, uh, it's really simple. Well, what happens is if you get paid yeah. a certain amount and all of a sudden you get a huge raise, it doesn't matter if you produce the same quality, a better quality, or worse. You just keep paid no matter what. Right. Yeah. Like then I'm like, well, you don't care. Like you're gonna get that price. Yeah. Yep. And you know, coffee as a commodity lives in that space. Yeah. Gotcha. So if you don't have the incentive, you start thinking, well, I'm gonna get a great price anyway, so yeah. I don't have to fight to differentiate with quality to get a little bit more. I'm gonna get whatever that price is. Yeah. I think that kind of a little bit complicates this conversation about sustainability mm-hmm. because. To me, that also just means then, um, especially in specialty coffee, it's not just a matter of let's just raise the floor. Mm. That doesn't solve necessarily all the all the complications with that. Which that's like that that needs yeah. to be a whole other podcast episode. That <laughs> um, yeah, Edwin, take this as an invite. Yeah, <laughs> it's powerful. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think um, even w- within that, like one pricing quality and just the general concept of sustainability, like you brought up the example right now of like raising the floor. I think from just what I'm hearing, what I'm envisioning is like, you have to do more than raise the floor. You have to like expand the whole room. Um, You have to like create more room, but also like there has to be something like more drive. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, you picked up the pricing, but what, what is that going to produce? What is that raise in pricing going to produce for the future? So therefore, there can be another um, pickup, and it just doesn't stay at that you know, area. We're not mm-hmm. trying to squeeze that room. We're trying to expand it, so yeah. in a sense. Yeah, yeah you, you nailed it. I think that's, uh, I mean, it's, it's good to have a big picture view mm-hmm. because it's really easy when you, you know, learn more about anything to to get really focused and focus is great, Mm -hmm. but you can quickly lose sight of of the bigger picture. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, it's not just coffee, but within coffee, you can see where if there's a triangle, you got to lift the floor of that triangle, Mm -hmm. but you also need to work to lift the tip of the peak of that triangle. So find those shining stars and Mm -hmm. really, you know, do some crazy things that people I've seen, you know, I've enjoyed partnering with people where they invest and market heavily a, a really expensive coffee where no one ever really makes money on that, mm-hmm. but there's just lots of joy and eyes are opened and, yeah. Yeah. and these connections are made because there's something very real about, wow, not all coffee tastes the same. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. so you're raising the peak, mm-hmm. you're lifting the base, and then you said, you know, expanding the space. Is, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's all three of those I think are done with education because every coffee has a home. So mm-hmm. you got to find ways to talk at all these different levels yep. to, to increase and, and expand appreciation for, for the product. It's powerful. Yeah. Yeah, that that is powerful. Yeah. Um, well, cool. I think well, this is a good. Yeah, that's that was awesome. Um, just a really great conversation. Thank you, Edwin, for coming on, sharing yeah. your, you know, 
your past, your life, your journey and stuff. So that was that was really great. I love that we just had that over some Jorge Mendez, uh, El Panal, which is wonderful. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's going to be a wrap for this episode. Thank you guys so much if you've been watching this on YouTube or if you've been um, you know listening to us on the podcast. Uh, you can find um, Onyx Coffee on Instagram, on YouTube. You can... I think, oh, well, you can find their website. Uh, they have their offering list, I believe, on there, some more of their background story. Mm -hmm. Anywhere else you would send people? Um, we're also yes. doing honey. Oh, I yeah, guess that's yeah. another piece. Yeah. And that yeah. all started with Jorge. Yeah. Oh, awesome. But uh, coffee yeah. blossom honey. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Because we're B2B, it's, uh, it's very relationship-based. So yeah. um, c connecting like this is very, very yeah. special. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. The, I, I mean, I don't know. I just want to give myself a little pat on the back because <laughs> there was a time where I was, uh, I was actually working behind the bar at Makeworth, mm -hmm. and some of my friends who just uh, rebranded a cafe to Visible Coffee Roasters came in, and they're starting to roast their coffee, and uh, Maddie was there too, and I was like, "Yo, this is a connection." I literally run out of the bar. I'm like you got to meet Maddie because you got to source like Guatemalan coffee with them. Like this is it. And I, I believe they started, I don't know. If, I don't know. I won't say anything, yeah. but I really hope that they're purchasing coffee from y'all. Cause yeah. I was so pumped about making that connection, yeah. but yeah, you're totally right on man. Relationship makes the thing go forward. I'll, I'll leave you with one last thing just yeah. cause I think it's just fascinating to see companies at different stages. Mm -hmm. And this is just, you know, taking a step back, looking at a bigger picture of what happens over time. Mm -hmm. um, I've enjoyed having a lot of conversations like this over the years where mm -hmm. I'm just going to re recall one of them. Um, it was another cold call <laughs> and I show up at this warehouse and this place it really should have been condemned. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I wanted to meet this guy um, because he was willing to talk to me. It was just that simple. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> Other people wouldn't talk to me. He was willing, he was curious, um, and uh, and he was roasting on I think an IR seven, which now would be considered an IR three because they used to uh, list them in pounds, mm -hmm. not kilos. So seven pound or a three kilo Diedrich roaster. And he introduced me to to one other person, and um, I mean it just didn't really feel like a real business, but that was the best connection I could make. Mm -hmm. um, that's Olympia Coffee Roasters. And he ended up starting EspressoParts.com as well. And wow. Was doing, and so, you know, that was Dang. a much humbler connection yeah. than you already have an established business with brand and, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. Man, such so inspiring I stuff. think having, yeah. having a long-term, yeah. you know, focus and, mm -hmm. and it's not just about passion. It's just having, I think, clear goals and, and yeah. why you're doing what you're doing mm -hmm. is course a big a big driver valuing relationships being thoughtful about partnerships that's something that i ask a lot of people to give me feedback on mm -hmm. and i'm constantly learning because your resources are limited you, mm -hmm. you, have, you have to make choices yeah yeah, yeah. So that's good. good that's good all right folks uh thank you so much for listening and we'll see you guys in the next one i'll see ya.